Hey everyone, welcome back or welcome to my channel if you're new here. So today's case is actually one that I've covered before, but instead of doing part two, I'm just gonna redo part one and put it together with part two just so it's easier for everyone to watch the whole thing. If you have already seen part one, I will insert a timestamp right now to let you know where to fast forward to to just see part two. But with all of that being said, let's just get into the usual disclaimer. So I report on very public information that anyone has access to. All of my sources are linked down below and all of the theories expressed are just theories unless stated otherwise. Now let's get into it. So today's case is on Rod Farrell and I find this case to be extremely interesting. It is a solved case, but sometimes those can be the most fascinating. I just find this case to be so interesting considering how young everyone was and then what they go on to do. It really shows that peer pressure can have a bad influence on people and you might do things in a group that you wouldn't do otherwise. So let's just start from the beginning with Rod's childhood. So Rod had a really bad upbringing to say the least. He was born on March 28, 1980 to Sandra Gibson in Murray, Kentucky. Coincidentally, that's actually my birthday too. So I guess Rod and I have that in common. She claims that he was born with his umbilical cord wrapped around his neck, and she believes that that led to some mental issues and caused him his behavioral issues that developed later in his life. Sandra was actually only 16 when she had Rod, and she really struggled to take care of him. So most of the time, they actually ended up living with her parents off and on because she struggled to find a stable household for him. When Rod and his mother weren't living with her parents, they were living in public-funded housing, as well as she was working as an exotic dancer and a sex worker to try to make it by. So she was kind of living a party lifestyle and just trying her best to take care of Rod. At the age of five, something really traumatic happened that would go on to have an effect on Rod for the rest of his life. He claims he was by the grandfather that he lived off and on with. And although there are no records of this and the grandfather was never charged, this did go on to have a big impact on Rod and his life. It has also been said that Sandra, Rod's mother, was involved in vampirism and she was charged with the solicitation to commit sex of a 14 year old as part of a vampire initiation rite. This was discovered because she was caught writing love letters to him where she talks about being his bride, which is really disturbing to say the least. She also allegedly mailed him a key to her house and tried to get him to live with her. In addition to this, Sandra was also said to talk to other minors in the area and to try to get them involved in vampirism. Some of them said that they would play a game with her called Masquerader, which would then turn into a vampire initiation rite. So with his mother being so involved in vampirism, it's no wonder that Rod was introduced to this life by his mother. It's said that the two connected over the movie Dracula and their mutual interest in a comic book called Vampire the Masqueraded. Rod's mom also recalls that when he was 16, the two of them went to see a movie called The Crow together, and this was really impactful on Rod as he loved horror, and the two just kind of shared this interest. So as I said earlier, Sandra raised Rod on her own, and his parents were not together. So throughout his childhood, he would travel back and forth from visiting his dad in Eustis, Florida, back to his mom in Murray, Kentucky. Now, Murray is a really small religious town with Baptist ties, and Rod really struggled to fit in in this conservative area. He was considered an outsider and a rebel by his classmates and always was getting into trouble at school. As he got into his teenage years, he started skipping school even more and spent his days reading about vampirism and painting skulls and began constantly wearing a cloak and walking around with a cane. He fully embraced the Gothic lifestyle in his identity as an outsider. So with all this bad behavior, it's no wonder that in the ninth grade, Rod finally got expelled from school, and this really set him down a bad path. At the age of 14, he started using drugs, which progressed to heavier drugs like cocaine and heroin, and he became addicted to these drugs, which led him to act violently. This drug addiction only worsened in 1995 when his mother married Darren Vraven, who was a local drug dealer. He supplied Rod with drugs and also taught him about Satanism and other kinds of rituals of that sort, and that got Rod really interested in that lifestyle. In his high school years, Rod became obsessed with the online role-playing game Vampire the Masquerade. 
This game went into the real world and a group of Callaway County High School students in Murray, along with Rod, began a real life role playing vampire group called Vamps. At first, this was just a harmless group that liked to LARP and do theater together and perform for an audience and dress up. But a lot of people said that Rod took this very seriously and it started to freak the Vamps members out and so they eventually disbanded. Shortly after this group disbanded, Rod was looking for another group to be a part of that shared the same views as him and really wanted to go extreme into the vampire lifestyle. This was when he met Jaden Murphy, who was already into the vampire lifestyle and really took Rod under his wing. It's said that one night, the two of them went to a cemetery and drank each other's blood, and this crossed Rod over to becoming a full vampire. However, this friendship was very short-lived, and quickly, Jaden and the other members of this vampire group realized that Rod was very disturbed. The group actually watched him throw a cat into a tree and kill it, which was a sign for them that they wanted nothing to do with him. So Jaden and Rod actually got into an argument over this, and Jaden actually dismissed Rod from the group and they no longer spoke. After getting banned from Jaden's group, in October of 1996, Rod had started his own vampire cult. This group included Scott Anderson, Charity Kess, and Dana Cooper, all of which were teenagers in Murray, Kentucky, where his mom lived. The cult would meet regularly at a place that they called the Vampire Hotel, which was an old and abandoned building in the middle of the woods near the Kentucky Lake. The group would often do drugs and hold their vampire rituals there. During this time, Rod was really starting to shape his vampire persona and decided to identify as a 600-year-old vampire named Visago, a devil worshiper from the movie The Hideaway. At this time, people were saying that Rod developed this godlike complex and was really losing touch with reality. However, much to Rod's disappointment, his cult would come to a short halt while he went down to Eustis, Florida to live with his mom as his grandparents had moved down there. This is where he would end up meeting one of his most loyal followers, Heather Wendorf. When Rod first started Eustis High School, Heather caught his attention right away. He saw her as a damsel in distress that he could save, even though she was really smart and capable on her own. However, she was very receptive to Rod's attention and just really loved being around him, so the two got close very quickly. However, although Rod was spending a lot of time with Heather, he was actually dating a girl named Janine who was Heather's best friend. At this point, the three of them formed their own vampire cult and were basically inseparable. It was at this point that the three became inseparable that Heather's parents, Rick and Ruth, noticed a big change in their daughter. Unlike her sister Jenny, who was a cheerleader and popular, Heather began to dress goth and became interested in very dark things. However, her parents didn't do anything like stop her from hanging out with Rod or Janine because they thought that this was just typical teenage rebellion and she was still attending school and getting good grades, so they really thought nothing of it. Just as the three of them were really getting into their vampire activities, Sandra, Rod's mother, let him know that the two of them would be moving back to Murray, Kentucky. Rod was not happy about this, and actually, on the day that he was supposed to be moving back to Kentucky with his mom, she walked in on Janine, his girlfriend, sucking his blood. This caused a really bad physical altercation, with Rod pulling a knife on his mom and threatening to kill her, with her also then pulling a knife on him. However, neither of them were harmed. This just goes to show how violent and toxic their relationship was. Despite this horrible physical altercation, Rod still ended up moving back to Murray with his mom. However, he did not stop with his vampire activities when he moved back, and he picked up his cult right where he left it. He still told Janine that they would date when he went back home. However, he also, being the player that he was, had a relationship with Charity Kess, a member of his group in Murray, who I mentioned earlier. However, Charity went to summer camp over the summer, and during this time, he picked up a relationship with a girl named Shy and actually got engaged to her while she was pregnant. 
However, this baby was not Rod's, but he said that he wanted to adopt it and raise it as his own. So Rod's love life was very entangled and he seemed to be quite the player. However, the second Charity came home from summer camp, Rod dumped shy and threatened to kill her unborn baby if she wouldn't leave him alone. So he was obviously a very disturbed guy. Despite his horrible temper, Charity was very devoted to Rod as her dad worked a lot, so she really liked the attention that he gave her, even though he was very violent with her and threatened to kill her on multiple occasions. Unfortunately, this violent behavior by Rod only worsened as time progressed. On the 13th of October, Rod and Scott, another one of the cult members, broke into the Murray Calloway County Animal Shelter and tortured and beat up to 40 dogs, even killing two puppies. This is disgusting, and it's so hard to imagine people being so cruel. It just shows how sick and twisted these people were. Although the police initially suspected Rod and his friend, they didn't yet have enough information yet to convict him of this, so they just interviewed him and let him go, unfortunately. Rod's life just continued to descend into chaos, as in early November, Charity told Rod that she was pregnant with his baby. He was not happy about this because he was still having relationships with Janine and Heather back in Florida and really didn't want to be tied down with a baby. So Rod and Scott were still talking daily to Janine and Heather back in Florida. And one day in early November, Rod told Scott that they needed to get Heather away from her parents as he claimed that they were hurting her. However, Scott asked Heather about this and she denied that her parents were doing anything to her. Still, for some reason, Scott believed Rod and went along with this. So Rod talked a lot about Heather's parents and how much he despised them, saying that they were snooty and selfish and that they didn't care about Heather. And him and Scott together began concocting a plan to drive down to Eustace and rescue Heather and Janine. Janine actually assisted with this plan as she sent Rod and Scott a map of Heather's house and let them know that the Wendorfs never locked their doors at night. The girls thought Rod was joking about coming to get them, but realized he was very serious on November 25th when he called them, letting them know that he was in Eustace along with Scott, Dana, another member of the cult, and Charity to come and get them. He told the girls to get their stuff together and to skip class the next day so that they could run away together, and the girls did so as they skipped class and ended up performing a blood ritual in a cemetery the next day in which Heather apparently crossed over and became a vampire. It was during this crossing over ceremony that Heather claims that Rod first approached the topic of killing her parents, and Heather claims that she told Rod not to. However, we only have her word for it, so we're really not sure if that's true or not. However, she claims that she told him not to. According to Rod, however, he claims that Heather was the one who planted the idea in his head in the first place and that she's the one who told him to kill her parents. He claims that he told her that he was planning on killing them that night and that she said that she still wanted him to and gave him directions and plans for what to do. However, again, it's her word against his, so we'll never really know what the truth is in this situation. At this point, after they were done at the cemetery, Rod claims that him and Scott took LSD and then went to the Wendorf house and entered through the unlocked garage. As I said earlier, Janine had given them a layout of the house and let them know that the doors wouldn't be locked, so they claimed that they entered this way. At this point, Heather claimed she was not home and had no idea what was going on. However, many people find this hard to believe, considering that those were two of her friends and she had been hanging out with them previously, and you would think that they would let her know where they were going next before before they actually went there or that she'd be curious when they left the cemetery in a hurry and went somewhere and she would want to know where they were going. However, she claims that she had no idea. The two entered the house on the night of November 25th, 1996, armed with clubs, but quickly traded those for a crowbar that they found in the garage instead. Richard Wendorf, Heather's dad, was asleep on the couch. Rod then proceeded to hit him multiple times on the head and the chest with the crowbar until he was dead. In the meantime, Heather's mom, Naoma, was taking a shower, so she had no idea what was occurring as she couldn't hear the screams. 
When she came out of the shower, she got a cup of hot coffee and then was face to face with Rod Farrell. She was rightfully terrified and reacted by throwing this scalding hot coffee on Rod, which only made him more violent and angry. He then proceeded to beat her viciously with a crowbar, severing her brainstem and killing her very quickly. Apparently Scott was the one who was supposed to kill her, but he claims he couldn't go through with it. Next, the two boys branded the bodies with their cult symbol and then stole the family's credit card, some of their jewelry, a shotgun, and their blue Ford Explorer as the getaway car. So later that night, Jennifer, Heather's sister, who was 17 years old, arrived home from work and noticed the horrible crime scene that had taken place. She immediately called police and actually told them that she suspected her sister Heather and Rod had done something to them. Meanwhile, after the murders, Rod and Scott went and picked up Heather and Dana and Charity in the Ford Explorer. They had switched out the license plates on the car and planned to go to New Orleans to start their cult back up there together. It was at this point when they were headed to New Orleans that Heather claims that Rod told her what had happened to her parents. She says that she was very upset and distraught However, she didn't do anything like call the police or try to escape because she claimed she was too scared. Back in Eustis, an arrest warrant went out for the five teens on November 27th. They were said to be in the area of Baton Rouge and police were out looking for them. They had been able to find out their location because that same day, Charity had called her mom asking for money and revealed the group's location to her. This phone call was then traced by the police and they were able to find the group. After the police traced this call, it really didn't take long to find the group and they ended up tracing them to a Howard Johnson's hotel where the group surrendered on Thanksgiving Day, so November 28th. So right after surrendering, police took the group into custody and immediately interviewed them to try to figure out what happened. Right away when being interviewed, Rod actually confessed and the police got this confession on tape. However, quickly after this, Rod rescinded his confession and actually claimed that he was being framed by the rival vampire group that he got kicked out of by Jaden. And then when the police realized that this definitely wasn't the case, they confronted Rod and told him that this wasn't true. And he ended up saying that that wasn't true. However, he had no idea what happened because he claims he suffered from blackouts and had no memory of what had occurred. On the other hand, Dana, Charity, and Scott all confessed really quickly and said that they knew that this was Rod's plan and Scott actually admitted to being present for the murders. However, he denied killing either of Heather's parents. Heather, on the other hand, denied knowing anything and stuck with the story that she had no involvement whatsoever. Interestingly enough, after the story broke, some of Heather's classmates came forward and said that she had actually confessed to them that she wanted to kill her parents and was actually planning on doing so. However, apparently this wasn't enough evidence and the grand jury did not indict Heather, so she ended up walking away free and was never convicted or arrested for anything. I'd really be interested to hear what you guys think about this. Personally, I think this was a grave miscarriage of justice. I'm really not buying this story personally. You know, allegedly, according to what Rod said, this wasn't true, as well as other members of the group. And I just find it hard to believe that she had no idea what was going on. But again, I'd love to hear what you guys think. Do you guys think that Heather had some involvement? Do you think she was innocent? Let me know down below. Now going back to Rod's case, on February 12th, 1998, Rod's trial began and he pled guilty to the four charges against him, which were armed burglary, armed robbery, and two counts of first-degree murder. Because he pled guilty, the issue for the jury was not to decide if Rod was guilty or not, but whether he should receive life in prison or the death sentence. In the end, however, the jury was unanimous and Rod was sentenced to death. He was the youngest person on death row for two years until 2000. In November of 2000, the Supreme Court of Florida had ruled that someone had to be 17 or older when they commit a crime to be sentenced to death, and since Rod was only 16 when he killed the Wendorfs, his sentence was changed to life in prison. Now, because of a lot of issues going on deciding whether children should receive life in prison, Rod did receive another trial recently in April of 2020, 
However, the judge upheld this life sentence and said that Rod would never get parole because he would never be able to be rehabilitated and brought back into society. And the judge said that he was basically corrupted and he was never going to be able to change. Scott Anderson was convicted of the same charges as Rod and sentenced to life in prison. However, in 2018, his sentence was reduced to 40 years and he will be eligible for parole in 2031. I'm also really curious to hear what you guys think of this sentence. Do you think it's too harsh? Do you think it's too lenient? Do you think he should be serving the same time as Rod, considering that he pleaded guilty on all the same charges? However, he wasn't the one who actually killed Heather's parents. What do you guys think? Let me know below because, you know, I have some mixed feelings on this as well. Charity Kess was convicted of two counts of third degree murder, robbery with a gun or deadly weapon, and burglary armed with a weapon or explosives, and was sentenced to 10 and a half years in state prison. Dana Cooper was also convicted of the same charges and was given a 17 and a half year prison sentence instead. She was released from prison in October of 2011 and Charity was released in March of 2006, so they are both now free. So as you guys know, the only person that didn't face serious jail time for this crime was Heather Wendorf. She ended up moving cities after all of this happened and ended up living with a foster family because her parents were killed and she had no one to take care of her. So she ended up moving cities and I guess lived a very low key life. She's married now, but I guess she has a very strained relationship with her family, which I'm not very surprised about because if I were a member of that family, I would maybe have doubts in my head if she was involved or not. And that would definitely cause a strain on our relationship. So three out of the five people involved in this crime are now free and Scott will be free eventually, so we will have almost all of the people involved in this horrible crime outside of jail and just living their lives even though they committed such a horrible act. This case is so fascinating to me because this crime was not only so horrible, but there's really no answers. We really don't have any rationale behind why this group did what they did. I really don't understand why these young kids were so easily persuaded into doing something so horrible. But that just kind of goes to show when you're a part of a group and you start to be a member of this cult and think like other people, you can just be so easily persuaded. And that's what makes cults so dangerous. But that's all I have for you today, guys. Thank you so much for watching and be sure to like and subscribe if you want more videos like this. Thanks again, guys. Bye.